My name's Ian Smith. Um, I work for a company called MSD. Uh, you may know them as Merck & Co. or Merck Sharp & Dome. Uh, any nomenclature is fine. Uh, and I work in IT. And unfortunately, I'm the worst type of IT guy because I used to be a research scientist. Uh, and I moved to the dark side about 20 or so years ago, mostly out of the frustration of, at that particular point in time, the IT organization that were with us didn't really understand research. And I kind of figured that there's a huge opportunity to become an IT guy and to really help transform the way that we work in the labs. And to be fair, I was pretty successful with some of that stuff, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, today, I'm part of an organization that's focused around uh, strategy and innovation. And I was asked a question by my current boss about six months or so ago. Um, understanding that our labs are going to get transformed and we're moving to this new digital world, as we have talked about a little bit today, um, what can we do to help ease the cost and burden of compliance, knowing that we're going in that direction? Um, so I spent the last five or six months trying to understand that. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit today about what we're thinking, just trying to give you a little bit of a sense about how we can transform the compliance space to help when we are ready as a, an organization to go more to a transformational digital lab environment. Um, and that's what I intend to do today. Um, so you may have seen this before. It came out of the original brochure from the Smart Lab uh, um, announcement that came out. But from a problem statement perspective, building on the question that I was asked by my boss some time ago, um, we kind of understand that the ecosystem in the lab is changing. We kind of understand that we need to become better at how we do large scale validation. Uh, and we understand today that some of the processes we follow are very disjointed, they're inefficient, they're expensive, they're resource intensive. And to be honest, having been out into um, the vendor space over the last six months, there's very little in, uh, industry vendors out there that are supporting this stuff. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is show you a little bit of an insight as to what we are thinking as a company um, uh, and how we're thinking from a compliance perspective, how we can get better in terms of automation and digitization. Uh, to really help speed up the process of validation from an IT perspective uh, so that as an IT organization we can become more of a credible partner to the scientific community as a, opposed to just a service. Um, and really the secret success to all of that I think is not just going to be the technology. For me technology is no longer the barrier. It's probably as we've talked about already a couple of times today, it's more around the people and the processes. So I'm hoping to give you a little bit of a sense as to where we're at today where we're going as an organization, just to kind of help you show how the compliance wrapper, if you like, which is very important to us as, as scientists, is going to really help be transformed to help you guys become more successful with your, uh, um, with your long-term visions for digitization in the labs. Um, so from an agenda perspective, I thought I'd start with a little trip down memory lane around how data is transformed today in the labs. Um, when I first started, it was a very different picture, and I thought I'd kind of kick off from that. We've talked a little bit about millennials. I started the company as a very young Generation X, and uh, as a very passionate Generation X person, I really wanted to change, but I struggled, because at that particular time, the previous generation was still set in their ways, and I've seen a generational change, and now my generation are very set in their ways, and the millennials want to work differently. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about how data's transformed today. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about three processes which often get confused um, and give you a little bit of perspective of how we see them. So there's three acronyms up there. Um, I thought I'd start with a bit of show of hands. Does anyone recognize any of them? Oh, great. So there's some folks in the room that understand, so I'll talk through those later. Um, give you a little bit of sense of where we are today from a technology and process perspective for compliance. And then I thought I'd talk a little bit about what our longer term vision is. Uh, and then a little bit of sense about how we're planning together. So you guys sitting comfortably? Okay, I should start. So, evolution of lab data. So I first started back in 1996 now, I believe it was. And I was a young Generation X guy. I came into the organization. I went into the labs. It was around the time that I just got my first Windows 95 PC at home. I just got my first 28K modem. I just connected to the internet and got my first Hotmail address. So I was really excited about the new technology that was out there. Um, but I was incredibly surprised that the labs were miles behind. At that particular point in time, I think we had something like 200 lab instruments across seven or eight different labs. 
if memory serves, we only had one that had a PC connected to it. At that particular top point in time, we were actually printing data directly from our instruments to dot matrix PCs and slapping them in our lab notebooks. So one of my first roles in the company was to roll out a new technology operating system known as Windows NT4 and connect some of our lab instruments as standalone machines to start storing the data so we could reuse it. Fantastic. Next generation stuff, right? Um, believe it or not, that project took around five years. And the reason it took so long was because a lot of the vendors in that space didn't even have software at that particular time. Um, so we spent a considerable amount of effort just trying to get the vendors to come to the party to give us the software that we needed to actually get to a point where we could get the computers out there. Um, and actually, by the time we got most of the computers out there, the operating systems become out of date. So there became a revolutionary cycle, which it turns out is still true today. Um, so after rolling the computers out, um, it became very obvious very quickly that the hardware that was in these computers wasn't robust enough to run the amount of time that we needed for the instruments themselves. And we were getting a lot of hard drive failures, uh, so we were losing data. And it was, this was around the time that uh, CFR 21 Pilot was getting really uh, popular and becoming more mandated. Um, so we were trying to understand a little bit about how we can get around this problem. So we come up with this fantastic idea of rolling out a process for backing data up via blank CDs. Fantastic. It was cutting edge stuff at that point in time, right? Um, but it failed badly. <laughs> and it failed for two very good reasons. Number one, CDs were only small and some of this data stuff was huge. Uh, and number two, the system owners or the scientists didn't really want to do the work because it was time consuming. It, it took an awful long time to physically get the data onto CDs. And some of these backups, you know, they, they might run three or four hours. You might end up having 10 or so different CDs. And then we had storage issues. So we had to come up with plans around backup and data disaster recovery and stick CDs off site and on site. And it was incredibly messy. Um, so our solution to that was we kicked off a project to revolutionize the labs. We installed an ethernet network and we connected our computers to the network. Wow, cutting edge stuff again. Um, and we backed that all up with a server which had a network share so scientists could now copy their data across rather than backing up onto CD. Um, again, brilliant. We were able to start sharing information between each other. Uh, we were able to start having some process that minimised the amount of time that scientists in the labs actually had to do physical backup work. Um, and we were better from a disaster recovery perspective. We no longer had media that we had to store anywhere. Brilliant, right? Um, but then we hit an issue, and it was a security problem. CFR 21 Part 11 was still very new. Nobody really understood it at that point in time. And our security organization considered it a risk to copy lab data across the network in GXP environments. So we had to stop. And we then took a step back and we rethinked our backup and disaster recovery strategy so we could become compliant and we could start making sure we were GXP uh, compatible and we were there with our compliance processes. So we thought USB drives, brilliant. Much bigger than CDs, much more convenient, took up less space. Um, but that was an absolute disaster because we lost them. We didn't know where they were. We had no um, chain of custody process. We put them in backup places that we completely forgot where they were. Absolute disaster. So we spent a considerable amount of time rethinking what to do. And this was around the time uh, a fantastic product came on the market called OpenLab. I believe the Agilent guys are here somewhere. Um, and we went full steam with OpenLab. OpenLab is an electronic contact management system and it gave us two really cool things. It gave us an automated backup disaster recovery process, which met CFR 21 Part 11 compliance. It automatically did the data backups because it physically pulled the data off our network PCs and stuck it in a database with an audit trail. Fantastic. Um, we rolled it out, took about a year or so, um, went global with it through about three, 4,000 lab instruments. And we still use it today. It's still used as our electronic contact management system. Um, but at that particular point in time, there was a use case that came from the business uh, where the, the fact that the data was now shareable and accessible by any web platform on any desktop machine in our organization, they wanted to start taking the data and using it in reports uh, in their electronic lab notebook. It was around the time we were converting to Ellen. Um, but at that point in time, although you could see the data in OpenLab, you didn't have any physical ability to access it on your office machine unless you had the instrument software installed. Uh, now, from an IT guy, pretty simple fix, right? Get the instrument system CD, whack it in the office machine and install it. 
Um, but our security guys went mad <laughs> um, because they didn't like the idea of that. We were opening up the office environment to uh, regulatory compliance, which meant we then had to start considering validating all our office PCs, which we didn't want to do. Um, and actually, we started hitting licensing issues with some of the vendors. They weren't happy with us using their software and multiple devices. Um, so we thought a little bit about how to get creative there. And actually, we implemented a pretty robust solution around Citrix. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Citrix, but it allows you to virtually <coughs> dis, uh, de deploy desktops. So you could access a virtual machine from any network device. So we installed our lab instrument software on our virtual devices uh, so the scientists could access it virtually. Worked brilliantly on some systems, but not all the lab instrument software was compatible. So we didn't use it for very long. Um, and then we moved on um, to things like we've talked about today, uh, bringing tablets into the labs. Um, we've uh, hit issues that I think were mentioned earlier around having obsolete operating systems in our labs. Uh, we still actually, believe it or not, use some instruments on Windows 2000. So we've had to start doing network segregation, which means we've had to pull certain machines off the network, which is costly, and the maintenance around it is horrendous. Um, and we're kind of, like a lot of people, moving to the cloud with our data, which has its own particular problems. Uh, and it's that sort of thing we're working through today. Um, and then from a future perspective, to be honest, who knows? Um, there's been a lot of interesting discussion today about things like the uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, um, I, I personally have no real insight into where we're going to go with this, but understanding that the history of the labs has changed a little bit from a young generation Xer to kind of like the new millennials who want to work very differently, I'm assuming that we will eventually change at some point. Um, but one thing uh, across this entire 20-year service that I've been supporting the labs over the years, um, data has evolved. The volume of data has got incredible. It's petabytes as opposed to megabytes these days. Um, access to data is becoming more and more uh, interesting because of security requirements, privacy requirements, uh, and regulation. Uh, and data is becoming more com complex. We have structured data, unstructured data. How do we bring those two things together? That, from an IT persp guy's perspective, is incredibly difficult. So vendors come up, they give you their speech about their tools and products, which have some fantastic capabilities. But as an IT guy, it just gives me a headache because trying to make sure the data underneath of it all is workable is, is an incredibly difficult thing. Um, regulation has changed over those 20 years. Compliance has changed over those 20 years. But you know one thing that hasn't changed over those 20 years? The reason I'm here today. Compliance. The way we do compliance has not revolutionized. We have not modernized how we write requirements documents, how we write design documentation, how we do computer system validation. It's the same process we followed 20 years ago. So part of my new role is to understand how we transform it. How do we as a company become more digital with our end-to-end -end system lifecycle process from an IT perspective, not just from a research and development perspective. So we've been looking at a few things, uh, a couple of acronyms again that I'll just talk through in a, minute, in a minute, but realistically we're looking at two things. We're looking at a common term which is called the uh, application lifecycle management. It's an IT process which I'll talk through in a minute. And then a documentation process known as the system development lifecycle. We're looking to automate those two things. Uh, today we do it very basically through, that, through paper. We're looking to make that more of an automated process. Um, so, so why do we need these two things? Why do we need all of that? Well, I'll start with a little bit of a definition process because these kind of acronyms can be thrown around at times and can be very confusing. So I thought I'd give our perspective as to what they actually mean. So the application lifecycle management from an IT point of view is the end-to-end -end process of anything you guys use in the lab that has an IT component. And it starts from right at the point where you have an interest in bringing something new in and it finishes at the point where you physically stop using it and archive that device or that instrument. So that entire application lifecycle management process can be 10 to 15 years long. And in between all that is how we run, maintain and operate that system as an IT person. On top of that, there's a process that we follow, which is known as the system development lifecycle, which is designed from an IT point of view uh, to be used across any industry, not just the pharmaceutical industry. And it's a best practice that is basically there to help us show that we're designing, developing, and releasing good quality products, good quality software, good quality applications. And then on top of that, there's a layer which is uh, relevant to our industry, which is known as computer system validation. 
And that is a layer above the SDLC, which allows us as IT guys to help you guys become compliant. So it helps us answer the, re the compliance requirements of the systems that you use in the labs. And they can be regulatory compliance, um, they can be functional requirements, GXP, GLP, GCP, whichever one you want to call them. Um, and we need them for, for a very simple reason, because it gives us as an IT organisation a structure and it gives you as scientists the confidence that the data you're creating is of good quality, is of good integrity and meets those compliance requirements that you guys have to, to meet as system owners. Um, and it gives us things like best practices, it gives us good security of data, I mentioned the integrity, it allows us to become reproducible in how we do things so in audit pro processes we can confidently say to the auditor, this is what we did with that system in question and this is why we did it and this is who did it. So it gives us traceability and it gives us transparency and more importantly it helps us with audit readiness. We get audited as an organisation and an industry hundreds of times a year by different organisations, internal, external, regulatory. So we have to make sure that we're prepared. And it goes back to that earlier statement I made, IT as an organisation want to be a partner, we want to be credible, we don't want to be just a guy that fixes your laptop when it breaks. So where are we today? Um, so today we have a very manual process. I'll call it an electronic manual process. I've heard a couple of interesting comments today already about the difference between electronic and digital. Completely agree with everything that was said. Um, so we as an organisation are probably in the same position we were 20 years ago when I first joined. We have a number of very prescribed industry standard tools that we use across the entire end-to-end -end life cycle of the products that you use. But today those products are not connected to each other. Uh, we typically only have one-way communication with the th processes that we use to store the physical documents that we create that gives you the evidence that that tool is, is validated and, and uh, has good data integrity. Uh, and then we have a very mature uh, life cycle process that we follow which is governed by our risk management and security teams. Um, but there's a couple of problems with it. Um, we have a lot of manual processes I mentioned. Uh, to be honest, quite often it's not always followed, so uh, not just our organisation, I'm sure it's true of every organisation, struggles sometimes to understand where the right information is. Um, uh, we as a company and a lot of other companies have become more agile with how they do software development. Uh, that may or may not be a, um, a term you guys are familiar with, but the way we develop software is changing. Uh, so we've had to adapt our processes to address that. Um, but ultimately we have limited communication between our tools, which means a lot of the handovers are done manually by people, so it's open to uh, transcription errors and translation problems. Uh, we don't have good transparency and traceability um, from an automation perspective to understand uh, how to get information at the right time to the right people. We can do it, but it can be timely and cost consuming. Uh, but ultimately, we don't have good analytics to understand what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. I think somebody mentioned earlier about continuous improvement in the, in the labs. Continuous improvement is also very true in the IT industry. We are very interested to use data about data to understand how we can be better as a partner. Um, so moving forward, we're looking to change the way we work very dramatically actually. Um, so we're looking to get away from using physical documents. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with terms like requirements documents, system design documents, testing documents, quality assurance documents. We're going to get away from the physical document itself and become more digital. Uh, so we're looking to develop a digital layer that allows us to store the relevant information we need specific to each part of the phase of bringing new systems to the labs. Um, we're looking to back that up with a, a very robust layer of analytics to help us understand how we continuously improve. Um, so great scenarios I've been involved with over the years. Uh, one lab, one particular lab had an interest of bringing a, a new type of uh, NMR into the environment. It took us nine months to uh, iron down the requirements for that system with a vendor. It took the vendor a week to bring it in-house. Why did it take nine months for us to understand how to get it or what it is we needed? On the flip side of that, we've had, it, we've had um, experiences where we spent two weeks putting requirements together. So we knew exactly what we wanted, we knew exactly who to get it from, we knew exactly how to get it. We got our requirements down very clearly and very quickly. Believe it or not, it took two years to get it validated and in production because the process of validating it was so complicated and so unknown at that point in time, we had to rethink the way we did things. 
So we want to be in a position where the IT process of making sure your systems are compliant becomes less cost effective and less burdensome to the scientific guys as, a, as, a, as an organisation as a whole. Again, building credibility, becoming more of a partner. So to do that, we're going to connect all our tools together. We're going to make sure that there's handovers between the two so we can automate a lot of our processes. So once we have good requirements, once we get a system into the labs, we can start doing automatic testing of it. We can start automating a lot of our documentation processes so that the time from delivery to the time to production use becomes a lot quicker. And we see that as a good thing because it's going to help from an efficiency perspective. <coughs> and ultimately, we're going to use the way we govern our IT processes and policies to <coughs> drive the efficiency of how we do our current documentation lifecycle process to become more efficient and more effective for you guys. Um, so that when there is a change in the lab, and the change is coming, when you do, become, do want to become more digital as an organisation, we're prepared as, a, as, a, as a, a, a credible partner to help you become more successful. Um, I think there are definitely, uh, there's a lot of interest in this in the company. Um, we can then become more kind of uh, proactive in terms of how we are rather than reactive, which is typically how we tend to be. Um, but it's going to take time. We've, I've already heard a couple of times actually about culture is the problem. I, I actually completely agree. Um, and behind that are three separate things as process, people and technology. I mentioned earlier, I don't think technology is the problem anymore. I think there's good technology out there. I think realistically there's cultural change management we need around people and processes. Um, so we've come up with a really interesting plan actually. Uh, I think the key to it is, is the millennial generation. Uh, they're very passionate about change and they're really interested for us to change. Um, and they are great advocates of it and great evangelists of change. Um, so actually we've been using some of their thoughts around how we become more effective in this space, actually in, in all of our spaces to be fair. Um, and the secret to that is collaboration. Uh, I mentioned really early on when I joined I was a passionate Generation Xer and couldn't believe how untechnological uh, we were in the labs at that point in time. I think we're now in a position where the technology has changed and the millennials are very used to that change, but us as Generation Xers probably need to change with it. Uh, I've certainly gone through a, a journey over the last few years to try and understand some of that stuff. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time uh, socialising the idea internally. We spent quite a bit of time building collaboration across the organisation. Uh, and we spent tr quite a bit of trying get, getting input from all across the, the different parts of our business, not just the scientists and not just the IT guys, but everyone else around it as well, to build a picture of how we move forward. And we've kind of picked a number of evangelists internally who are going out there and, and shouting the benefits of what it is we're trying to do. And it's working. Uh, we're moving forward quite rapidly, actually. Uh, we've built a very robust roadmap to get us there. Uh, and that roadmap's been publicised generally. Uh, and we've gone through the process of making sure our quality organisations are happy with what we're doing and they've been part of the process and they understand the rationale behind it, what it is we've got to do ultimately because there is going to be a long term need to help influence some of our regulators because of the change of the way we're doing things. Um, and we are really keen to start thinking about how we become more flexible with our mandated processes. Uh, we are a fairly large organisation, we don't all work to the same way, we all have needs to work differently because of the different organisations that we have and the different business units that we have. So we have to become flexible but ultimately we have to try and standardise where we can. Um, and then really it's down to the three key things from a technology perspective. Um, let's say enable the interoperability, the connectivity between all our tools today across that entire life cycle. Um, let's develop a really good, robust digital workflow, so become more digital as opposed to electronic, which is typically what we are today, and then use a layer of analytical insights to help us understand what's working, what's not working, and where that continuous improvement loop is. And with that, I thank you very much for listening, and thank you for your time.